Hi. Uh, yeah, we're, we're here trying to program a bit of web backend in Haskell. So uh, just let me introduce myself. I'm Alejandro. I work uh, at the university as a PhD student. I use Haskell normally, not that much web development, but I do sometimes. I also wrote a book about Haskell where you actually can read about all of this stuff if you want to read more. Uh, so uh, first, uh, just a few things. My idea would be to, to, to run uh, this workshop in four blocks. So each block will have a bit of me telling you something and then a bit of you reading and doing. So first of all, we'll talk about routing and how to create some HTML, then about uh, database access, then forms and validation, and finally how you can deploy and add some middleware to your web. And, and in the middle, I would like to, to leave 10 minutes so we can just go to the bathroom, have something or whatever, and, and also to, to uh, have some question and answer part. So, uh, in, the, in the practical part, feel free to, to ask some questions and I think what, is, what works quite good is we, we keep track of the questions that are interesting and then we, we all speak about how this can be solved. Uh, so uh, the exercises are, are in the GitHub. Uh, for every exercise there is a template for the solution so you don't have to keep, uh, to, to, to lose time trying to create a cabal project and writing like a lot of code and you go directly to, to what we are going to learn today. Uh, you may not be able to finish everything here. Actually, I think if you finish everything in the time, then you shouldn't have come at, the, at, <laughs> at all. Uh, and I actually would suggest to work in pairs because I, when, when when I've been learning Haskell, I noticed that people usually learn there from many different perspectives. And sometimes it's nice to see how other people code to, to, to think about how you code yourself. So that's my suggestion, but of course, feel, feel free to work uh, alone if you want. So, so first of all, as an, as an introduction, sometimes if, when you try to, to approach something like web development in a, in, in a new language, uh, the landscape just looks so big. So uh, in Haskell, you have a lot of libraries. You have like web frameworks, you have Hubstack, Snap, Yeast, and people saying one's better, one it's, the, the other one is better for some other thing. You have a lot of ways to access database, and these things usually look very different from each other. You have many different ways to do templating, and, and well, this uh, happens in every language. So Yes, don't, don't feel scared about this. Uh, for today, the menu is going to be to talk about uh, the Spock framework, uh, to talk about the persistent library for database access, and then we are going to talk about uh, Blaze and Shakespeare for templating. So what you may wonder is, is uh, I'm actually hiding you something from telling you these things instead of the, the other things. Well. I don't think so because the way these libraries are, are developed are very modular. So actually Persistent, which is a database library we are going to talk about, uh, was part of Persistent and it, it, it was part of GSOT, sorry, and it became its own living organism. Uh, Blaze templating was done before any of the other framework actually existed. So, and, and you can miss all of this. How you do this is, uh, well, you have a lot of strong conference via typing. So, so you can match them and, and ensure that everything works together well because of these types. And, and also, most of the, of the things that these uh, libraries are structured, most of the concepts are just general concepts in Haskell language, like monads, like functors. So, so you should be able to take all the things that you learned today and go to a snap or use it and apply most of them. Uh, but of course, this is not a definite choice. Plus, if, if you are going to use Haskell to create your super nice web application in production, just don't use what I told you before reading what actually may be better for your specific case. Uh, in any way, what I chose, I chose it because of simplicity. So all the libraries we are going to look today are very simple. 
but they are examples of how Haskell approaches this whole area of web development in a, a strongly different way that you could do this with Python, with Scala, with any other language. So with a lot of typing, with a lot of uh, interface based on functor, applicative monads, and all of that. Uh, so just before I start, really, uh, when you are going to run the exercises, it's just going to be a Cabal project. Cabal is the tool to build and distribute uh, Haskell code. It's a bit of uh, ant and you get an NPM all together and mix in sometimes not very nice way. Uh, it builds a project, it unloads all the dependencies and uh, sometimes you have to spend a day trying to make it work again. But uh, if you follow the the instruction to, to, to uh, prepare for the workshop, you could ha have uh, installed all the dependencies. So you, th there shouldn't be any problem today in this. In, in any way, just tell me if you have this. Uh, however, uh, this is not the best way to work if you are actually running a, a Haskell project because the libraries are not going to be sandboxed. So that, that means that they are going to be shared across all the projects we are working today which is nice because we don't have that much time to download the dependencies over and over again. But if you're working on a project, I, I encourage you to use the sandboxes in Cabal. So now that you know all the preliminaries, let's uh, move into this. So uh, basically the talks, uh, the, talk is, uh, the, the, the theoretical part is, go is me showing some small pieces of code and trying to explain how this works. Uh, I would suggest not, not, uh, you not trying to copy in this in your, in your machine. Uh, in, the, in the GitHub repository, you have all the code that actually runs, so you can copy and look from, from there. So OK, the, the, the first thing, of course, we need to do is to create a hello world. And creating a hello world is just too simple for us, which are developers, which yeah, we already know. So we will, we will uh, start by saying hello and your name afterwards and so this is how the code looks so right now it, it's just like a bunch of different things so uh, you, you you can uh, see two different uh, well, th three different parts so you have the type signature of the main thing which is just the common uh, Haskell thing and then your main has a first line which just setups running your your uh, application on a web server which is integrated in this Spock framework. So you basically you say run your Spock application on port 8080 and then you just have a Spock T which you don't really need to care too much right now what, what does it mean. And then what you get is a list of uh, description of your roots. So here what you, what you say is okay every time you you have something which starts with hello and some name here, please execute this part of code. And, and what you should do is just return the text hello and the name. So this, this is, should be very basic. Just uh, try to create a root and return some text. So, uh, each of these parts is what we call a handler. And if you are used to this uh, kind of uh, Sinatra, Scalatra, Flask type of web frameworks, you will notice that this look very, very similar. First, you have a verb, which is what kind of uh, request uh, you are going to get. So you can get, you, you can use get, you can use post, put, delete, all the, all the common HTTP verbs. Then you have a root, and then you have the action to perform where something matches on this root. And, and if you notice, the root is not like a, a string. It's actually done of different parts. And each of these parts can be three things. So you, you can have just a literal string, which is going to be match as it is, in this case, hello. You can have a slash slash to, to sh make a separator. And you can also have variables. And these variables are what is going to be captured and be uh, given to you as parameters. So if you have here, hello, Yon, then your name parameter is going to take Yon. 
What is interesting here is that actually these roots are type safe. So if I declare this thing, so I have allow and then a variable, and I say, OK, please ensure that h is an integer. So when I try to match something like allow Peter, this doesn't match the root. So this is not going to be executed. But if I have allow 3, this will match the root, and actually it will tell you that you are not allowed. So this is, it, this is, I think this is nice, because this is showing you how you can use types to do something more than just checking your invariant. This is actually uh, giving you a contract that your root should also verify. Uh, so r right now, the action has just been text, but you, have, you can have a lot of action being performed. And, and the best thing is you, you just query the documentation for all the things that you can do. What it's important is that all this action form a monad. That means that you can just basically say one after the other, and this will be the result of all your, all your action. So for example, here you can set a cookie and then return text, but you can also redirect. You can uh, set the contact type, set any kind of header. So you do this this way. So if you would like to say hello, but now instead of saying just the text returning HTML, you could, of course, do this. You could create your HTML. Uh, this fancy small, uh, smaller than, greater than is just the concatenation operator that works for this kind of string, which are not strings. Are, it's another different type. But OK, uh, say, you, you could try to do this. But this, of course, is, is very bad. It's hard to maintain. What happens if you uh, forgot to close at h1? What about injection attacks? Ah, you shouldn't do that. We all know that. Ah, this is this is wrong. You should be all screaming and going out of the room because I just show you that on the screen. So uh, let's look at how you return HTML enforce, enforcing this wall formedness. So uh, you have, as I told you, have many of these libraries. You have Blaze, which is based of kind of showing HTML as a monad. And, and this Haskell code imitates the HTML structure. So you will see now an example. And, and basically, it's like you write your HTML, but it's, it looks like Haskell. You also have Shakespeare, which is actually the idea that you can write HTML and then be treated by the compiler before by using template Haskell to generate uh, your uh, type safe code. And you have also many other kind of templates. You have Haze, which, is, which looks more like PHP or uh, JSP kind of template, where you have places which are, are changed. So if, if we are going to write our hello, hello uh, with Blaze, that's how it looks like. So you can see that the, the, the HTML part, which is everything but the first two lines, just follows the, the structure of your HTML. So you have HTML, body, h1. And then inside, when you want to have more than one thing, you use do. Because this, this is uh, also a monad, so you can sequence different things. And you have this uh, exclamation mark to attach attributes to your, to your HTML. So this, this, this is, well, first of all, this is Haskell code. So this is all type check. So for example, if uh, a style takes a string, but if you have something like width, which takes a, a number of pixels, then you will have an integer there. So somebody took care to make everything type safe. Uh, you, since this is also a Haskell code, you could use your, your uh, maps, your false, whatever, to generate this code, which is also nice. And, and also, the text here, you can see we say text name, takes care of the injection attack. So it, it ensures that. Whatever the, the user uh, fits you in, it will be given as a real HTML and something which, which they can give you a script. If you are more into, into writing HTML, instead you can use uh, Shakespeare, which is a, a, a whole range of, of uh, yeah, they are called quasi quoters, but this is not a fancy name, uh, of things which translate from things that look like other languages into Haskell. In this case, this translates into things that looks into HTML into the actual previous code. So writing this is exactly the same thing as if I wrote the previous code. 
uh, if you look, there are these fancy things here, this, uh, and this Hamlet, which is what is called the quasi quoter. It basically tells the compiler, please, uh, instead of you taking care of this, please call the s Hamlet function before, which is in some library, and then replace what it gives you in my code. It's sort of a macro system, some kind of thing, but not really a macro, it's more like a, uh, in Lisp you have this read, uh, I don't know, the, I don't remember the name right now. Well, anyway, you have here some kind of create bindings. And then, uh, this, this is nice, we can create things that look like HTML, but then we will need to convert it to uh, a string to be actually returned. So you have this uh, you can look that there is a render HTML which uh, moves from the HTML to the actual uh, string, but this string is not actually of the string type, it's of another type called text, which is more performant if you are going to make a uh, string manipulation. So uh, actually the full story is that actually you don't have a text type, is that you have a lazy text type and a strict text type, because sometimes you would like to use one or the other, and unfortunately, Blaze and Spock developers think differently about what they should be using. So you have to convert from the lazy type, which is given by, by Blaze or Hamlet to the strict. So that's why you have two strict. And then you basically have the HTML, which is what uh, Spock gives you to return HTML. So, yeah, so far so good. So now it's time for fun. Yes, take some exercises. I have two of them. Uh, if I recommend if you're a beginner in Haskell, you use the first one, which tells you how to return JSON instead of HTML. Uh, it shouldn't change that much, but it introduced a very useful library called ASON. And it also uh, has some exercise on basic routing. If you are an advanced Haskeller, I suggest you to go to the second exercise, which is how you could uh, have an application state by using another library which is called STM, which is ab about software transactional memory. So, uh, and don't be shy, ask question. We will write them the interesting one and we'll share after the break. And yes, if you have some question in the meantime, I'll just raise your hand, I will be going around. So, yeah, have fun and in five, ten minutes, we'll go back and, and speak about databases. Yeah. Uh, it's the E1. So the, the P1, so the, the, ones, the, the, na the ones named P are about the, what I've shown you here. So if you need to copy code or see a full example, you can use it there. And E1 are the exercises, I think. Or are, no, no, they are the other way around. Uh, yeah, the P1 are the ones here. Oh. Here is the, the URL. How many people are downloading Cabal libraries? Uh, how okay, let, while you are downloading, let's move on, and then you can have more time uh, later to do this. I think that's going to be a bit more useful than... Okay. So databases, because, yeah, the data, it's important. Yeah, our, just running our Haskell application, it's going to make us very happy, but not our customers. So we want to save the data. And uh, there are uh, two main approaches here, as in many languages. You have all these libraries which just target a particular database. You have for PostSQL, for MySQL, for SQLite, for Mongo. But you have also some libraries which provide a common access layer. So uh, I really think that there are many, many cool stuff in the first part about relational algebra where you actually think in a more uh, yeah, relational algebra thinking of what uh, your queries are. But I think the more productive uh, library to do database in, in Haskell is persistent, which is so, sort of a functional ORM, which is uh, an object relational mapper, so it's going to be like a, a record, an RRM, record relational mapper, something like this. Anyway, 
basically what, what, what you do if you want to use this library is first you de this define a schema. So you tell the library how your data should look like. And it's look like this. And if you notice, we are using, again, a quasi quoter. So we, this is not the, the part in the, between the, the bars is not Haskell code. It's just uh, a small language which allows you to define what sh is tons and tons of Haskell code. Actually, I can, uh, after I, can, I can show you how much code this generates. But basically, here you are saying, OK, I have two, two entities, user and task. And you have, uh, and a user has a last name, a first name, and a task has a title and a, and a user. So uh, just spoiler, our exercises are going to, to be about somebody creating a web application about users and tasks. So, uh, and you have other stuff we will, we will go later. So, so basically what this is generating it's in your head should be something like, Something like I define my data user user first name is a string and your last name. So this 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 define this Haskell code plus a lot of more things. Yeah. What's the data This is uh, so if if you look at the first exercise, there is how you can derive your JSON uh, data type to convert from a record to JSON automatically. So this is basically calling the thing uh, up front so you don't have to write it. So it saves you like 10 characters. But uh, yeah, and, and the unique, we are going to speak about it later. So basically, this is, this is doing this. Uh, but it also generates a lot of other stuff, for example, and another data type, which is called user key, which is a data type that we are going to use to, to, to speak about identifiers only for this kind of entities. It also generates uh, a data type entity field of user, which uh, tells which are all the fields in this entity. And we will see that this is useful later when you, when you want to refer to a field in an entity in a query, like tell me things that has a first name this. And it also generates uniqueness con and data type that represent uniqueness constraints. So in this schema, what unique name with this capital U is telling is uh, ensure that uh, every record has a unique combination of first name and last name. So this is how, how you, can, you can do this also in most of SQL databases. So but it, yeah? Is that because it's going to generate code to create the schema? Like, does the unique constraint actually do anything in memory? Or is it just so so if, if uh, this code, this code I'm showing you here, it's not going to generate code to generate the schema. Uh, you can have something which is called like migrate, which also generates a code to create the schema in a database. But this is only because if you want to have everything well typed and to ensure that everything you do is well typed, you have to give all this information up front. Uh, yeah, and also, yeah, instances for DB and JSON serialization. So this is taken care. And it does the same for task. So the first thing you will notice if, if, if you open the, the project uh, with this is that now we have a lot more uh, code instead of our our run spoke, which was, if you look, the, 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 the white part is what we had before, and now we have a lot of things around it. So there are some parts which, yeah, well, there are three different parts. Uh, the, the, the orange one is something that unfortunately we have to, we have to do, is just uh, set up some login because persistent forces us to do so. So here we are just saying, please don't log anything. But this is just uh, something I don't want you to take care of this. So you, if you are doing logging, you should look about how to do logging properly with, with this. But here, just not doing logging, but we need it to compile. Uh, and then uh, we use here this SQLite with SQLite pool. So this is creating a pool of 10 connections to the example.db database. And every time we, we, we run 
we want to run a query or to do something on the database, we are going to use this pool to get connection. And this all takes care of the pooling and, and ensuring that everything get teared down when it should and, and all of that. And, and then if you want to run a transaction, what you do is you run, you use run SQL persist and pool. And you give the pool and the thing you want to run, which is this F, and this performs this using this pool of connection. I don't know that whether this is completely clear. This is a lot of code. Basically, the, the important part is that we are using here a pool of connection we have to set up with the, with the green part. And when we want to use it, we, don't, we cannot just call F. We want to run F using this pool. So we use run SQL persist and pool with this pool. You will notice anyway that there is something going on there, which is this lift IO that I have here. And, and, and what's it all about? So, so database access is not really something that is pure. It does some input output. So that means that when we run some things on, your, on our database, we have to run it in the IO monad, which is the way in, when, in which Haskell separates the impure code from the pure code. Uh, but, uh, so, so, so we would like to do this, but unfortunately we are inside other monad, which is the monad using by a Spock. So a Spock have its own monad which takes care of a lot of stuff. Uh, but there is a type class called monad IO which helps uh, you to move from any kind of IO thing that you want to do into a larger monad. In this case, a Spock, a Spock T is an instance of this monad IO class. So every time we have an IO and we want to run IO inside our, our web application, we need to run lift IO to move from our IO A to a Spock T of A. And this is what lift IO. So th this, this is usually very useful if you are doing this kind of uh, real world Haskell things. You, you, you define something which is a monad IO and, and then uh, you can run any IO inside. So this breaks a bit all this uh, purity that you have here, but if you, if you are, uh, doing something the database access, you have you really need to do this. Okay, so uh, yeah, let me go quickly through this. So if you use persistent, you have the normal things. So you can insert things on the database, and we are using here insert unique, and you can see that we just give an an object which is a value of this data type. So this is the data type that it was generated and we can use it at any other Haskell data type and we just call insert unique. And this takes care of uh, inserting the thing in the database and check that the uniqueness constraints are satisfied. And it returns you either nothing, which means I couldn't insert it, or maybe with the identifier. You also have insert, which is a different alternative which doesn't check the uniqueness constraints. So it depends on your on your own uh, on your own problem domain whether you want to enforce that constraint when you insert or not. You can also query by identifier. That means something that I forgot to explain to you that every any kind of these types come with always with an extra uh, field, which is the ID, and this is always taken care of by by persistent. So you never see this. So you don't see here an ID field. It's only on the database. But when you want to query things, you have to know that this ID exists. And this ID is not only something which is an integer, it's something of, of your specific user key ties. So if you have a task, then you have a specific task key type. And this ensures that you are not using an identifier in a wrong place. So if you want, yeah? Um, are those identifiers So, so uh, no, no. So what, what there is is a default for each kind of database. So every 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 connector to a database defines my by my default. My ID is going to be. I know that for SQL is an integer. For MongoDB is one of these UIDs, uh, but but you can define it yourself. No. So there's persist just has a default for the name of the column and the type. Yes. And yes. You can you can of course override all of this, given but but the, the the syntax is not 
is this kind of syntax which discourages you to do this. <laughs> so, uh, but you can do this. Yeah, okay. So as I said, keys are strongly typed. So you cannot really mistake a task key for a user key. But it also means that when I want to query something and they give me just the integer, so this user ID is going to be inferred to be an, an integer, I have to create a user key out of this, out of this uh, integer. And I do this well. In this case, I'm using SQL, so I use SQL backend key, which will, it's just a, a type synonym for integer in this case. And, and you can also see here uh, uh, that you, you can use Spock to, s to return a 404 error if you want by set status. But uh, how do you get that? Basically, we have two get functions here. Uh, how should know that not with the Spock one? Yeah, so this, this code is wrong. This, so I, I should, uh, in the real code, I have uh, the get from the DB is qualified. So uh, it's db.get. It, it, it will complain if you try to run this uh, as it is here. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you can query by identifier. You can also query by, uh, by data. And you do this using select list. And you have also select keys if you only want the keys, or select sort if you want, uh, instead of a list, a sort, which is some, some of a more performant data type if you are going to do a streaming computation. But basically, in this case, you, you, you can see that we are using a new, a new uh, kind of values, which is this user first name and user last names. Our constructor that were, were not mentioned either uh, in, the, in the definition of the schema, but are things that are generated by persistent to refer to each of the fields. So when I use user first name, that's the first name field of the user, uh, of the user entity. So this again strongly typed and you have a lot of different kind of condition you have equal you have less than you have all kind of uh, SQL thing uh, in this case it's a bit weird that and is represented by list concatenation and or has a special a special operator or but that that's how it is uh, and if you want to do more things like uh, please order this or limit to a number of things, there are many, many things you can look at the documentation. So just, I don't want to be exhaustive here. So time for farming again. Uh, so there are two exercises more. Uh, one is about working with persistent and learning how to update and delete, which is most of the time is just instead of get, you use delete or, or, or update. And I also have another exercise which goes one step farther than this persistent library which is the Skeleto library, uh, which uh, exists for, for, uh, because of the fact that persistent uh, targets a lot of different kind of databases, not only SQL, but also no SQL databases. So that means that its query language is very limited to the intersection of all of this. But Skeleto allows you to create code that only works with SQL, but is more performant than SQL. For example, if you want to do a join, persistent doesn't have a join operation. You really have to go f uh, and make, uh, a r you have to round trip. You have to get your data and then for each of this, go around. But this allows you to have join. So, uh, and also have a syntax which is more similar to SQL. So I encourage you to look at this if, if you want to, to know more. So again, don't be shy and ask question. And uh, yeah, after, after this, uh, like uh, in, in 10, 15 minutes, there will be a break and I would like to use this to, to have a question and answer part. So if, uh, like in, in 10 minutes. So have fun. Yeah, you, you, you cannot, you, 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 you can do this. So it's, it's just a data type. It's re, it's, so it, it follows this kind of, of uh, ORM, which you really have to be very explicit on when you save things. Mm -hmm. and there is, it's not like, I think, active record in Ruby is kind of this thing where you change things and you don't have to mm -hmm. name. And, but here you have to do everything very, very explicitly. Yeah, Say, like, you know, like, or insert record with first name, or if you could say, here's a user, 
update. Yeah, you can do all of this. So you can also create an update which only says update this record and it, it doesn't give you back. The, so you don't have to do get the record update and put it back. So you can do this. But, but uh, if you don't save it, then it's just not saved on the database. So let's, let's go back into trying to uh, explain some small thing. First of all, I promise you that I would show you what this schema is generating. So uh, this is the documentation for the, the, the module, for the DB module in, the, in this exercise. I just uh, did this running Cabal Haddock, which is the tool to create documentation. And you can see that it generates the, the type as I, as I said, so it's like user with first name and last name, but then it generates how to show it, how to convert it to JSON, and then it also created some other data types which are just local to this definition of, of, of user, so key for the user is actually a new data type also for the field, so you can see that all of this was generated from you, and user ID is key of user, and the same for task, so this actually generating a lot of code for you. So, yeah, let's go back. So the, the, the next thing is now you wrote some code, but you didn't actually check that anything was correct. So what if they gave you a user which has an ID which doesn't exist or something like that? You, you will get an error from the database, but you would like to validate this before. So, so yeah, what the user does not exist, what the task title is empty, so we need validation. So the first thing you would do is, okay, why don't we do it by hand? Just create a validate function which gets a thing and returns a Boolean, tells me yes or no, and then if I, I call this validation, and then if it works, then I do something, and, and if it doesn't, then I just return a different thing. Uh, instead, you can think, oh, what instead of return just a boolean, I actually return one of these maybe types. So I return nothing, which is, uh, well, this is, hasn't been validated, or I just return the same, the same element in a just constructor. So, so you can do this like this, and it makes, I would say, that the same sense. But actually doing the thing with, the, with maybe is actually a great idea. Because maybe it's a very composable thing. It's a functor, an applicative, an alternative, a monad, a monad plus is all sorts of things that we all like to, to say at least. I like to say applicative and alternative. Uh, so, so we are not going to look at maybe as a monad today. We are going to look at it as an applicative. So if you follow the news in GHC, applicative has recently become a superclass of monad, which basically means that Every monad is now an applicative, but not every applicative is a monad. So this is just a, like a more general abstraction that monad has. Uh, and what it gives you is uh, this set of operation on a data type. So you can return, you have pure, which just has a value and wrap it somehow into, into may, into in this case maybe. Uh, you, have, you can uh, map a function, so this is like f map. This is like your functor mapping. But you also have this composition that if you look like there is an extra maybe there, and this is going, that's where the powers come from. Because uh, that allows you to, to sequence a set of validations, and if one of it fails, then the whole thing fails. Uh, so th the rule for this maybe applicative is if something is nothing, nothing is what you will be given out. Uh, so how you use this applicative pattern when you want to use validation. So imagine you have some basic data uses. You have title, which is a maybe string. Uh, you have a user, which is a maybe user you got from the database because maybe the user does not exist. And you have this non-empty thing which checks whether a string is not empty. And just to, to make the code a bit smaller, I, I just uh, wrap it from maybe string to maybe string. So what you would do is, OK, how do I create a task? A task has a user and uh, a title. Uh, so if I want to check that the user is correct, the title is correct, and if everything is correct, then I want to apply the task constructor, you always use this kind of thing. You use the dollar at the beginning, and you use the, the star. 
uh, and you can have more than one star. So this, this actually can be any number of arguments. So this is sort of uh, like you have function application, but you have this extra effect from the maybe, uh, which in this case is if something is nothing, does please give me nothing out. And there are many, many applicatives. So every monad is an applicative, but, but uh, so you have a lot of things from there, but there are many other things which are applicative. And in, in the case of the validation, this works really, really neatly. Mm -hmm. yeah, but basically, basically why you can, so, so you have this problem for many other data types like either. So when you have this kind of error-like thing, if you stop on the first error, this is gonna be a monad, but if you want to, to have as much error as possible, usually it, it doesn't. And why is because in a monad you can have something depending on the previous result. So one thing you cannot do with an applicative is this checking to depend on this checking. So this, the types doesn't allow you to do this, but you can do this with a monad. You could have like let, uh, sorry, like do check this and then check this depending on the value of non-empty. So the fact that you can do this uh, forces you to stop on the first error because then what would you do if the other thing has an error? So this makes a monad. But if you want to have everything, then uh, it doesn't form a monad anymore. So this is more or less the, the idea. So validation one, is there any other ones that came to mind? Uh, so usually all of them are sort of uh, this kind of thing where you have several things running in parallel. So there is, there is uh, other, so there are some examples where there are things which are not actually Mon are only applicative and a monad and they differ and how you do this. So there is a library called Haxel which has this sort of problem, but then they, they wrap it in such a way that you cannot observe the differences. So this sort of, it's applicative and not a monad, but by abstracting what you cannot do, then they sort of uh, make it right again. The other thing you need to know if you want to do, use it like in a web framework is how you get information from the parameter of a post query. So this is like, let's move on to a completely different thing, but you need to know this before I can show you the rest of examples. So uh, the, the interface for a Spock is just to use param as, and as in the other case, it takes care of, of uh, type inference. So it is param, usually it's uh, only returns uh, maybe, so it returns a maybe of something and this infers the type of the maybe to return based, well in this case, how you use it. So if you, if you look there, uh, here I'm using param first name and last name to get my first and last name. If they are not there, then, then nothing will be given. And then I'm using the, the maybe to, to ensure that user is uh, nothing so if I, if I get nothing, that's before because there is some wrong user data. Either the first name or the last name are empty. And if everything is okay, then I can I use the rest. So okay. So maybe it's not the best, and the solution is uh, something similar to validation. Why, why it's not the best? First, uh, there are no error messages, so that you fail. But okay, well, that's really not helpful for the user to to uh, return us better results. Uh, then there is also the, the problem, that so, so you define how your validation is done, but you don't define how you want your, this, this problems to be displayed, how to connect your maybe with your parameters. So you ha we had to do this ourselves by hand, so this is not nice. So this problem is solved by a library called digestive functors, uh, which defines a bunch of, of data types uh, called well, forms and views. Uh, which allows you to, to save all this information. So a form will, will, it's like a maybe where you have extra information about which parameter should hold each information and what's the error, what's the error message to give if, this, if there is a problem. Uh, there is, they also have views which allow you to, to, to display information. So to, to move from a form, the definition of a form, you give it some data and then you get a view like, is this correct or do you have some errors and which are the errors? And then there is a, a library called Spock Digestive which connects directly from a, from a Spock uh, request to one of these digestive functor uh, definitions. So you usually have, so you can reuse this, this, this thing for many other libraries. You have like a Spock for many, li for many libraries and also if you are using GSOT, they have their all implementation of forms but the A form 
is like this uh, trajectory factor. You have also M form, which is a form which is monadic, which has some of the problems we were mentioning before, but you, you need it sometimes. So how you define a form? So if you look, we have the same thing as before. We have the, the dollar thingy and the star thingy. Uh, and we have the checks, but now we have some extra information. So instead of just calling the not empty, uh, I'm calling check, which has a, 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 boole a, a Boolean predicate. And then if this fails, there's the error message to show. And you also have this uh, dot colon to refer to identifier. So basically what this is saying is sort of what we were doing before, but taking care of all the parameters and everything. Uh, but now it's doing everything in one go. So it, it looks at the first name and then it checks it's not empty but with not null. And then if, if it is, this the error to, to show. And you have also this check M, which is a special kind of check-in which allows you to perform monadic action. So, you don't, so for example, if you want to uh, look in the database like we are doing here, then it's, this is not a pure function. This is a monadic function. So you, you can also use it uh, here with uh, digested. So when you have a form, you use this uh, following this, this sort of life cycle. Uh, and and I'm, yeah, I'm using Haskell and life cycle in the same phrase, which is not usually done. But uh, anyway, uh, so you have your, your form. And usually, the first time the user comes to you, it makes you a get request for your, for your uh, thing. So you take this form. And then you run it through get form, and it returns a view, which is a view of an empty form. So how, how is the data of this form if there is no, no information given? So and then you can, you can convert it to HTML or JSON or whatever. When it goes back again, then it won't be a get request, but a post request with some parameters. So instead of get form, you call it with run form. And if this is OK, then you get your shiny, shiny just thing. Or well, in this case, it won't be a just, it will be like, uh, view of this thing, and it's okay, so you just do whatever you want to do. And if you have errors, you get a view again. So this view is the information of the form plus all the errors. So that's the information that you should display to the user back. So this doesn't tell you how to display in the sense that which is the HTML, you have to do it yourself, but it tells you which is the information that you should display to the user given the information of the check-in that you've, you've, uh, you've set. So uh, here is the, the same life cycle, but, here, but now with our example of a new user. So if you get a new user, then I'm going to define what I define my user form. So I, get, I use get form and get my v, which is the view. And now I, I want to convert this view to HTML. And I will, I will show you a function user view later to convert from a view to <coughs> HTML. And then the rest is just what we were doing before. So this view is going to be a form element in HTML. We wrap it into a body in HTML and then return it with, with Spock. If we have the, the post, then what we get uh, here is, uh, is a view and then the information from the type. And this type, this new U, is going to be just or nothing, like as we were using maybe. And if it's just, we do what we were doing before. And if it's nothing, then we can actually reuse the same thing if we write it in the way that if there is error, show me the errors. So we, we, can actu we could have actually uh, make this one, one function. So th this is how it works. You either use get form or run form, depending on the, on the point you are with the data. And now you have to move from your view to your HTML. And how you do this? Uh, well, you, uh, you basically can do it by, by hand, but there is a nice library called Digestive Blaze, which allows you to perform this uh, easily. So you have like special things like error, li error list or input, input text with take care of generating both the code for the, so they, they look Add the information in your in your form definition, and it tell and it shows okay what should be the type of this, how should I convert it? So if I use write input text, but this is a number, then it takes care of, of some things around there. So it's just uh, a nicer wrapper uh, around generating your HTML. So this is not really very important, but you to know that this kind of uh, thing libraries exist to make life easier. 
So time for more fun. So but that's today ju just just one time because we are spending a lot of time or downloading cabal things. So we, we only have time for one exercise today. So that's just a form for creating tasks given a user identifier. And we have an extra exercise which is by choosing an user from a list. So that means that you have to generate your information about all the possible users beforehand before showing the form. Uh, an extra you will you can see in these exercises that uh, defining things in this way it does not only resemble more what you think about it's also you can reuse this form not only for for post or get in a spoke you can use it if you are working with JSON data you can reuse the same form definition and then the last name and first name will be your your uh, of the the keys in your JSON object and if you are uh, there are many of these things so if you are using WebSocket then well I suppose it the uses also uses JSON, but there are many of these things to, to connect forms to many kind of input data and output data. So the thing is uh, Spock, uh, Scotty, which is another uh, web framework, you said all built on top of a common API, which is called the web application interface or Y. Uh, so that means that the, that, so this, this gives you two benefits. First of all, uh, the same application can run in different contexts because uh, this application is not really dependent on the web server you're running. It doesn't even have to be a web server. So there are, there are things like, uh, like a, a thing called Way Handler WebKit which sort of wraps your application and sh uh, shows it as a, as a JTK application you see in JTK WebKit. And you can also, so usually you, when you uh, run, when you are running it now, you're running it through a standalone web server, which, which is called Warp. But if you were, uh, if you would like to have this like in a an, um, Apache environment, then you would use another handler, which uh, make it like uh, into a fast CGI uh, interface. So this is this is nice because you can run your same application in different contexts. Uh, so how does this, this application usually look like? So you have this web server here, and then you have your application which uses whatever framework you like, and there is just this layer in blue which is the, the application interface, that's how you communicate. But actually, why applications are really, 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 really simple. So they are almost like this, so I'm, I'm not telling you the truth, that's not exactly the type. But it's basically you have a request, you tell me a request, and then I give you a response. And then I'm allowed to do some I.O. Uh, things because people thought that it's quite common to do I.O. inside a, a web server. So it's this, this is very composable, actually, because if you, if you think, if you have something which changes a bit the request, it's just like a function from request to request. Or if it, you want to change the response a bit to change some headers, then it's just like something from response to response. So in, in case you were wondering, the actual data type looks more like request to request to IO response to IO response. Which is a, a, a bit more complicated. You will like this because then you can, you can uh, do some things uh, a bit faster. So what it means is that actually in, in this thing you can put something in between and this something in between is going to be very simple. It's going to change something on the, res on the request that it's going to be passed or whatever the response is, it's gonna to ch is going to change something. And this is middleware and this is uh, common throughout all these uh, things that work in, in Way AI servers. So you have something like uh, middleware static which is uh, used to serve static files. So uh, you've been running something with generate HTML, but sometimes there you would like just to to generate to have some HTML preprocess and this to be to be shown to the user. You have also middleware preprocessor which runs a command before serving. So this is helpful if you so you, you love Haskell, so you are going to write your front end application also using GHC, GS, or pure script, uh, but you have to compile this thing before showing them to the user so this uh, middleware takes care of this or but you can use it for any kind of preprocessor and you have also way extra which has like 
tons and tons of these middlewares which wrap something and add like uh, compression, basic authentication through HTTP, and, and a lot of different stuff. So you can look at you can look at all of this middleware. And and but really the the yeah the takeaway here is that since our application have does that simple simple type, it's very easy to think how our middleware will work. So that's that's the takeaway from here. So if you want to use the middleware in Spock instead of uh, in any way I application, there is a, a specific call to be made, which is middleware. And this sort of says, OK, from, from now on, whatever my Spock application is, now it's going to be wrapped by this middleware that I'm telling you. So it looks a bit strange because it sort of looks like monadic, like you are saying this is the middleware and that's the get. But you should think like the middleware is configuring the server to have this middleware around. And in this case, we are configuring uh, using the, the middleware static uh, package. Uh, so if we have something, we will we'll first try to look it on the static uh, directory. So this is what uh, the policy, which is try to look in something which you had base before, so static slash whatever you told me, try to look it. And if, if it doesn't, then uh, try with the rest. So, so this is just in, in one line, you can add these static files here. And then, so we, we, we've been building all this shiny new application which is going to rule the world, and we want to deploy it. So our application finally leaves the nest, and I just want to show again this picture which I really love, that you have seen. Uh, so, uh, yeah, basically that's what all. So I'm not going to tell you anything about deployment apart from the fact that it's quite easy to deploy in things like Heroku. So it's, it's quite easy and one of the exercises is about how you can do this. So there, there is, basically you have your Cabal project and from this you can get all the information and then you just call it to deploy and it runs. And I can, and I can, I, I, I can show you that I've done this myself and it actually runs if you, in case you, you think that, that cannot be true. Uh, so, yeah, so, okay, so then thanks for, for listening and you can, you can find me there and go in around, so on. Oh, thanks.